Okay, first uh, <coughs> I want to thank Kirill for organizing this meeting and for inviting me. Um, my talk will be, to a great extent, a continuation of Donald's talk. Um, I'll tell you about uh, a certain uh, structure in perturbative gauge theory and gravity, uh, kinematic algebra. And this is um, based mostly on the on work done with Donald, but also with Rutger Bowles and Ranka Iserman. And also, uh, briefly at the end, on work to appear with Songhe and Oliver Schlotcher. Okay, since uh, we were told that as some people here who don't work on these fields, let me just make some very general comments. So a scattering amplitude expresses the probability of going from some in-state to some out-states. And then we have momentum conservation for the particles involved. But we can, by convention, say that they're all uh, incoming to, to make it more symmetric. Uh, amplitudes are computed traditionally by Feynman diagrams. Um, and then we have the standard picture where the tree diagrams correspond to the classical contribution to the scattering. And then the loop, um, uh, the loop diagrams correspond to the quantum corrections. Um, now, what is good about them? Well, they have a clear space-time interpretation and they are right. They give the correct answer if you can uh, get to it. Uh, however, they're inefficient for a um, uh, high number of legs or, or, or loops, and they obscure uh, many symmetries uh, of the problem because the individual diagrams will not have all the symmetries that you expect from the amplitude. So modern approaches explore um, uh, many things to try to overcome this, um, using formalisms which impose uh, kinematic constraints, such as the fact that particles are massless, um, explore the analyticity of the amplitudes as a function of the external data and, and the symmetries that the amplitude should have. And this has led to new formulations of uh, perturbative quantum field theories and um, to the exploration of connections between different theories. And this is what I'll be uh, focusing on. So I'll be doing the third, or probably, review of BCJ, which is just to get the message home. Um, this I'll briefly review the kinematic algebra in self field gauge theory and gravity following Donald's talk. And then I, I will say how this appears in scattering amplitudes in several examples, both in the self dual theory proper and in cases which are closely related to the self dual theory. Uh, whether that closeness is more or less uh, um, obvious. Okay, so. Um, well, uh, that gravity is the square of gauge theory at level of free fields. It's not so surprising. A massive vector has d minus two degrees of freedom in d dimensions, and a massive, uh, I mean, the massless two tensor has d minus two square degrees of freedom. And you can write a polarization uh, tensor as the product of two polarization vectors. So in four dimensions, um, a massless vector has two helicities, has two states, and then a massless two tensor has two states corresponding to plus, plus, minus, minus. Those will be the gravitons with the density <coughs> plus and minus. And also two other states uh, whose combinations give you the diloton and the axion. And in higher dimensions, the diloton and the two form fields, which in four dimensions has a single degree of freedom, which is the axion. If you want to now ask what happens to these at level of interactions, then scattering amplitudes are the natural object to look at. Um, you want to look at um, amplitudes for scattering of n particles, um, and it will depend on the um, labels of those particles, the momentum, polarization, and in the gauge theory case, the Lie algebra index, and for gravi in the gravity case, the momentum and the polarization tensors. So why would you be re interested in relations between amplitudes of these theories? Well, it's partly because uh, QFT is hard, but uh, in the gravity case, it is terrible, uh, as, as we've seen here. Um, so the Einstein-Hilbert action, if you expand it, uh, it has an infinite number of vertices, and they're all terrible, starting from the simplest one. So this uh, notion of a, 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 of a double copy appeared through in, in, in different ways, and the simplest example is at the level of the three-point amplitude, which is completely fixed by Poincaré invariance where the gravity amplitude is just the square of the gauge theory amplitude. And here I, I, I write it without this color dependence uh, in the notation that I will explain now. So this is just to set the stage in case you don't remember about your gauge theory. Uh, so when you want to write down an amplitude in gauge theory, you have to decompose the color and the kinematic dependence. Um, and um, one way of doing it, which is uh, quite common nowadays, is to expand the color dependence in terms of color traces. 
So this is a trace of the product of uh, matrices which are generators of the Lie algebra. Um, and then you sum over non-cyclic permutations because this is cyclic. Then the coefficients, um, which will depend on the momentum and polarizations, are the partial amplitudes or colored ordered amplitudes because they correspond to diagrams which have this prescribed ordering of the external particles. Um, now, the, um, the way that we learn in, in certain textbooks is um, the, to express the color is in terms of some color factors. So we just use the Feynman rules and at the end of the day we'll, we'll build up s some Fs which will be uh, uh, chained together through their indices and these color factors will represent um, graphs with cubic vertices because the F has three indices. So this F is a structure constant of the Lie algebra of the gauge group. Then you can um, group your, your kinematic dependence in, in terms of the coefficients of these graphs and, and express it in terms of some scalar propagators, one over p squared for each internal line of this uh, cubic diagram, and some kinematic numerators, depending on momentum and polarizations. Now, the issue with this way of representing the amplitudes is that it's not unique because uh, these color factors are not independent because they're, they're built from Fs and the F satisfy Jacobi identity, then these color factors will also satisfy Jacobi identities for, for certain uh, sets of three graphs. So you can shove in uh, um, contributions from one graph to another. Whereas here, this partial amplitude is, um, is a gauge invariant object. So what can we learn by expressing the amplitude in this way? Well, we can actually learn a lot, and that's what uh, uh, Bernd Krask and Johansson found some years ago. You can write the amplitude in this way, choosing numerators such that they have the same algebraic symmetries as color factors. So whenever three graphs um, have their color factors satisfying this identity, then, I mean, the plus or minus depends how you write it, um, then the kinematic numerators satisfy the same identity. Now, this is a very strong constraint on, on, on the amplitudes. So this is in this way of looking at the amplitudes. If you think about this way, the corresponding constraint is that there are some linear relations uh, among the partial amplitudes, which are the so-called BCJ relations. So here, uh, this is a sum over non-cyclic um, permutations. So there's n minus one factorial of them to start with. Um, at the end of the day, after a number after the BCJ relations and a number of other relations, there are n minus three factorial of them only independent. Uh, string theory has played a big role in this. First of all, in proving the BCJ relations for the first time, and and also in providing some insights in, in, into this um, into this um, colored kinematics duality. In hydrotic string, it's intuitive that that, that you can think of of um, color in kinematics as arising from left and, and right sector, and also. Um, S some computations in string theory want to represent the amplitudes in this way. And this is what happens using the pure spinner uh, formalism by these people. Interestingly, this is conjectured to extend to loop level. Now, if you look at this, what this structure suggests is that, is that there is some kinematic algebra analogous to the color algebra which will be the underlying reason of, of why this is also true. And that's what we'll be looking at in some examples. Now, a big part of the interest in this is that if you manage to write your gauge theory amplitude in this way, then by substituting the color factor by another copy of the kinematic numerator, you get a gravity amplitude. These numerators can come from different um, gauge theories, say n equal, say pure Young mills and n equals four, so pure Young mills gives you n equals four supergravity or n equals four, times n equals four gives you n equals eight supergravity. And then the states which are scattered in gravity are just the, the product, the direct product of the states in the gauge theory. Now at three level, this is equivalent to, uh, to an older set of relations, uh, the KLT uh, relations. So they're the same statements, but instead of having the kinematic numerators, uh, expressing it in terms of the partial amplitudes. And then this is a sum which is uh, mediated here by a so-called momentum kernel um, that uh, Emil talked about. So this will be some polynomial in the Mendelstam variables. And, and this is a sum over certain permutations. Now, this is also conjectured to be true at loop level, uh, meaning this BCJ double copy. Notice that there is really no simple way of extending this to, to loop level. 
uh, whereas here, there's a very simple way. You just take, um, you, you, here in the gauge theory, you just take to this to be the contribution at the loop L order, and then there will be some loop integration here, and this will depend on loop momentum and these two, and then the same thing for gravity. And this has led to uh, amazing studies of supergravity um, uh, amplitudes um, and, in, and their ultraviolet um, properties by these people and possibly others. And the state of the art, as far as I know, in, in four dimensions is n equals eight supergravity and n equals four supergravity up to four loops. Okay, so now we will, uh, I will briefly review what, what Donald said. There is a sector in these theories which, which provides a, a, um, a very simple understanding of, of what is going on. And somehow what happens more generally must be an extension of this. These are the self-dual sectors of, uh, of the theories. So they admit scalar equations of motion. Uh, Donald went through this in detail. You <coughs> use some light cone coordinates and, and you define this, uh, this differential operator in these coordinates. And then in self-dual gauge theory, you can go from the standard equation of motion to this equation of motion by, by choosing a specific gauge. And there's an analogous thing for gravity uh, where this is uh, then another equation of motion for a scalar. So here you have um, one set of FABC and one set of two derivatives. Here you have two sets of two derivatives. One here and the other expressed through these Poisson brackets. So then um, the, this Poisson bracket is associated to a Poisson algebra with this um, structure constant, as Donald uh, described in detail, and this corresponds to a Lie algebra of area-preserving diffeomorphisms. So these are diffeomorphisms which have unique Jacobian in this plane. <coughs> then in self dual gravity, uh, one can look at the Feynman rules and see that the vertex goes like x squared and in gauge theory like xf. So this x is a structure constant just like f. <coughs> So this is a precise manifestation um, of the color kinematics duality. And um, here I wrote xij, but you could just write whichever one you want because of momentum conservation. And because x is a structure constant, it will satisfy the Jacobi identities. So bcj is manifest. Okay, so how does uh, self-dual gauge theory and gravity, um, how is it embedded in the full theory? One way of looking at it is to look at the light cone Lagrangian. So for both gauge theory and gravity, um, there are Lagrangians uh, for two degrees of freedom only at the price of introducing non locality. So let's use light cone coordinates again. Now you can, you can do this by starting with your gauge fields. Um, so this component will be zero, that will be a light cone condition. And then you have some components. I'll call this. Uh, if you do this, you, you, you can see that you can integrate out this component V, and uh, what you get is this expression. And it's that integrating out which will lead to these inverse derivatives here, which make this non local. Um, so you have here a propagator, which takes you from minus, so this corresponds to minus helicity, this corresponds to plus helicity. You have here a propagator, which takes you from minus to plus helicity. You have a plus plus minus vertex, a minus minus plus vertex, and a four point vertex. Um, now, the first two terms will correspond exactly to the truncation um, of the um, self dual gauge theory. If you want to get the equation, the scalar equation that I showed before, then what you need to do is to take the equations of motion um, and then set a bar equals zero and a equals its derivative of phi. There's a similar thing for self-dual gravity. Of course, things are a lot more complicated because there's an infinite number of vertices. Uh, but again, you get a propagator from minus to plus. You get a plus plus minus vertex and a minus minus plus vertex. But then you get an infinite number of vertices. Okay, so we will um, we'll use this to, to derive some Feynman rules. Uh, but because now I will look at how exactly the expressions for amplitudes look like uh, using these rules, I will want to introduce the spiritualism formalism for the, um, for the people here who are not familiar with it. So, so this is a formalism we, we, which is used to, because it takes advantage uh, of the facts that we are dealing with massless external states. 
So let's take a given momentum um, in, in four dimensions and uh, let's dot it with this vector of matrices. Uh, this is the identity and these are the poly matrices. And then you, you can write it in terms of these spinorial indices. Now, if the momentum is uh, on shell, that means that this matrix is singular. And so it has rank at most one and you can write it as a product of two spinners. Now that you have those spinners, you can define some spinner brackets, some uh, a product of spinners, either the um, lambda spinners or the lambda tilde spinners. This minus here just depends on your conventions. Um, and because of this not notation for the brackets, you, you can also write them like this. So then uh, this Manelstam variable for, for these massless particles is just expressed like this. And then we can also define more complicated uh, objects where we dot more indices, say this object here, where we have the lambda index, uh, the, the lambda spinner for particle i, the lambda tilde spinner for particle k, and then um, just uh, dot us in a spinorial form with, um, with some momentum j, where this momentum now does not need to be on shell. And a similar thing here for longer objects say in this one where now you have lambda of i and the lambda of l and then two momenta here. These spinners satisfy um, an identity due to the fact that they have only two components is this uh, Schalten identity. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. Rutger is gone so I don't know. Um, if the momentum is real then the, the, there's, a, there's a conjugation relation between the two spinners. Okay. So um, using this and the Lagrangian I showed you previously, we will write some Feynman rules, but, um, but in terms of this spinner helicity formalism. So let's define the, the gauge as, as, so a light cone gauge is defined as the A dot um, a null vector uh, vanishes before this null vector was this one. Um, but it's nice to keep this, uh, this vector there to, to make sure that because we're explicitly breaking um, um, Lorentz invariance and we want to make sure that things cancel out so that the final expressions we get uh, should not depend on, on choice of lambda. And um, let me also define this dot here between the momentum and eta. And these are the rules we, we get from the previous Lagrangian. So this is for the plus plus minus vertex. There was this x, this f is from the Lie algebra and then there's this, pre this kinematic prefactor and this x is defined in this way. Um, using the, the, the spinner eta. And this is uh, anti-symmetric. And then there was the other vertex and the four-point vertex. The propagators are as standards. Now the elicities, you, you don't need to, to consider the several components. It are, it's just this, uh, these external factors. Okay, now gauge invariance is that the amplitude should be independent of, um, of both this spinner and this spinner. Um, the simplest case is the three-point amplitudes. These are the external factors. This is the vertex plus plus minus for this choice, and this is what you get. So, the, as advertised, the eta's cancel out. Now, the self-dual sector is when you only use the plus plus minus vertex. So, let, let us see an example. Um, this four-point diagram here, we have one minus and three plus. Now the propagator must connect plus and minus, and this is the only way if you want to use only this vertex. So you can now write down the numerator of this diagram, which is using the rules, but not putting in the propagators. And um, what, what you can see from these prefactors is that uh, this internal particle, because it's minus on one place and plus on, on another, it just cancels out. And then you see that you can actually write some special rules for the self-tool sector where the um, where the vertex is really only xf, it does not have this prefactor, and then you just uh, change these external um, factors here to, to include the, these factors. Okay, so x can be seen as an off-shell spinner bracket. For any given momentum, uh, on-shell or off-shell, you, um, you can define a spinner using uh, the spinner eta by contracting its alpha index. And then this is, the x is nothing else than the spinner 
for the, the, the spinner bracket for these spinners. Then the Jacobi identity that I mentioned previously uh, just follows from the Shelton identity for this bracket. Okay, so let's write some uh, amplitudes like this. Uh, at three level, it's easy to see that you, that's in self tool sector corresponds to amplitudes where you have a single minus. So, so let's say you start with the vertex. Then if you want to have another vertex of this type, well, because the propagator connects plus and minus, you would need to add something like this. So then your external legs, you can easily see, will only be, uh, you'll have only one minus and the rest will be plus. And uh, this is an example uh, of such a graph. Let's say that particle R is minus. I, I, I won't say now which, which one it is. And using these rules, this is what you get. So, so this will correspond to, to the um, helicity factors. Here, this is to compensate for the fact that particle R is minus and not plus like all the others. And then you, you just have a, for each vertex, you have one of these X's. Now it's... Um, no, no, no. Here I'm just representing one graph. In, in, in Baron's Gilly, you, you, you sum over graphs uh, to, to, to obtain currents. So here I'm just looking at the numerator of, of one graph. Um, yeah, but the, using these rules, the Baron's Gilly currents also look very nice. Um, now these amplitudes are well known to vanish. So, so this here is depending on, on this spinner eta. I told you it shouldn't. It turns out that when you sum over all the graphs to form a gauge invariant expression, this vanishes. And you can actually make a choice such that the numerators themselves vanish, because the numerators are not gauge invariants, only the amplitude. Uh, so say, but if you take eta to go to r, then the spinner bracket, because there's an epsilon there, uh, goes to zero. And then it's obvious that the amplitude vanishes. At one loop, um, so at three level, we have one minus. At one loop, you, you, can, you can see, say, in this example, that you can only have external pluses. Say, if this is plus, then this is plus minus. Now this connects to a plus, and this is plus minus. And yeah, you can play around and convince yourself of this. Here again, so now all the particles are pluses, that they have the same external factor, and we have an x for uh, each vertex. Now, higher loops are outside the self tool sector, using only this vertex, you cannot construct any higher loop graph. And uh, what, what I've said above is also true for self dual gravity. Um, the only difference when you write down the amplitude is that you should square the numerators. Now, I've presented you expressions for this graph, which we call the comp topology, and this graph, which will be the n-gon. And it turns out that these graphs determine the complete amplitudes. Uh, because we have a BCJ representation. So, so this is the notion of the master topology. Given diagrams with this topology, you can obtain all the others. Let's say at six points, you for the first time get a graph topology at three level, which is not a comb, but you can obtain it uh, using the Jacobi identities. Um, so, so the numerators and the color factors will be related by this identity. And uh, at one loop, say the, the master topology is the n-gon, say at four points is the four-gon, and then if you subtract it with these guys exchange, then you get a triangle. And then you can easily see that from an n-gon, you can get p-gon for p smaller than n. OK. So I've told you about, um, about amplitudes in the self-tool theory. Now I'll tell you about amplitudes which are not in self-tool theory but are closely related. In the simplest case, they will be next to self-dual sector amplitudes. So in the self-dual se sector, at three level, we have one minus. We saw that they vanish. And at uh, one loop, we have the O plus. These are rational amplitudes. Uh, they have no unitarity cuts. So being rational means that it's not just the integrands, which is rational. Once you do the loop integration, typically you would get some special function like a dialogarithm or something like this. Uh, but for these specific amplitudes, uh, you, you just get a rational expression. And the next to self dual sector, which is adding one more minus particle, uh, at three level corresponds to the MHV amplitudes. These are the simplest non vanishing amplitudes uh, at three level. It's maximum helicity violation. And at one loop, you get another family of rational amplitudes, 
which is the one minus. Now, can we get PCJ for these ones? Yes, we can. So we have one more minus in, in both cases. Uh, let's say it's particle one. Then we, we make a gauge choice such that this spinner goes to coincide with the one for particle one. Now, I told you that in the self-tool sector, you used only the plus plus minus vertex. If you now have one more minus, you need one more type of vertex, which is either the three-point vertex of different chirality or the four-point vertex, okay? And it turns out that when you take these limits, all the diagrams with the four-point vertex are suppressed. And so you get only the other vertex, which introduces the X bar rather than the X. And also particle one must be attached to X bar. Then at tree level, um, the numerator for this diagram, uh, well, th there will be some external, uh, some external factors related to the helicity. Now for particle one, it will be a bit different. And, um, and then you get all the vertices X, except for the vertex attached to particle one, which in this case will be this first one, which will be X bar. And uh, at one loop, uh, similarly, all the vertices are X except for, uh, for the one attached to particle one, which is X bar. Now, all the Jacobi identities are still true because uh, they involve mostly these X vertices. When it involves also the X bar vertex, it turns out that because we're taking um, this choice, it, then it is also true. So, so the, this gives us two uh, families of one loop amplitudes for which we have uh, compact uh, BCJ numerators. It's the all plus and the one minus. Now, if you want to take this um, beyond these helicity choices, um, there is one way of doing it uh, which makes it valid for any choice of helicity and indeed any dimension, so uh, any polarization um, vectors in any number of dimensions. And this is using the sketching equations that we've heard about here already. And the sketching equations relate the Mendelstam variables to, um, to points, uh, to, to complex numbers, which can be interpreted as points on the Riemann sphere because uh, there's an SL2C invariance uh, of, of these equations. So you have one equation per particle, and, and then you just sum over, for each equation, you just sum this uh, over the other particles. Now, this provides an extension of the self tool story in the following sense. If you define, if you call this object Xij, um, uh, then for some solutions of the sketching equations, this will coincide with the object that I mentioned previously. So for n particles, there will be n minus three factorial solutions to the sketching equations. In four dimensions, two of them will be very simple. They will just be um, ratios of, um, uh, of components of the momentum in these light cone coordinates. So, so, that, so there's two conjugate solutions here and they will correspond precisely to the x and to the x bar, which was the one from the minus minus plus vertex. Now, but now, you also have x defined for other solutions of the sketching equations. And using this, you, you, you can write, since you can write your amplitude using the sketching equations as a sum over, over contributions corresponding to each solution to the sketching equations, also here you can write your BCJ numerators as a sum over uh, BCJ numerators for each solution. So each one of them will, will look um, will look a bit like this one. Um, since there has been some progress at one loop using these sketching equations, it's natural to ask what would be the, the, the extension of this. So can you be more detailed for this description? How do you find numerators using the next So it's, uh, th there'll be expressions which will be precisely like this. So, so, so I told you what X looks like. There's also an analogous, you can define also an analogous X bar um, using the solutions to the sketching equations. And, and then, um, well, your amplitudes um, using the sketching equations so is, is obtained as you have some measure. Emil was calling, he was writing it like this, which include these delta functions. And then you have some Fafian. And then you have, you have this, um, this, Park Taylor factors and other permutations, right? So now, what you want to do is to write this guy. So, so this is like a color dressed amplitude because it has these, these color traces, right? So you want to write this guy as a, as a, 
as a, as a sum over cubic diagrams for, yeah, and, and this, this is possible to do, uh, well, with some BCG enumerators, and this is possible to do precisely because this is supported on solutions to the sketching equations. So this would be some, uh, some BCG enumerators for a given solution to the sketching equations, which I'm labeling here I, and then you would have to, again, sum over them to obtain the complete BCJ enumerators for the amplitudes. So then the amplitudes would be written as a sum over I. So um, you would get well, actually, if you write it like this, you also need to write this Jacobian. So this would be your um, this would be your BCJ enumerators. So you sum over graphs, but then you sum here over the over the solutions to the sketching equations. This guy. This is also as is as the correct SL2C weights. So it will also give, at the end of the day, uh, um, it's also guaranteed to give a rational expression. Um, so in each solution to the scattering equations, uh, they are, they still obey the Jacobian identity. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. So so so, 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 so it is a construction which is essentially the same as this one. So in, in the same sense that that for the park taylor factor corresponding to MHV, you could write some numerators like this. For these park taylors co corresponding to generic solutions to the sketching equations, you can write an analogous expression. Okay. So this is one type of extension that you can do to this, uh, this object X. So No. So, so the polarization comes in the Fafians. Oh, right. You see, yeah, yeah. this X will enter in this NIs, and, and the polarization comes in this Fafian here. For the MHV formula, you could kill the four point vertex by one choice, right? And hmm. then when you go further, you apparently cannot. Uh, well, there's, there's an analogous choice here to. Um, uh, maybe I should have put some more slides about this, but. Uh, there's an analogous choice here, which is in the sketching equations, you can you have the SL2C choice of where your particles lie. Here, you, you send, say, particle one. In this case, you can send it to infinity. And, and that's an analogous choice. You, you don't have to write it like that exactly, uh, but, but that is the simplest way of, uh, of getting these numerators. That's right. All the sums, uh, sums, when you sum together, it's not guaranteed to be rational because you have a gauge freedom. So it's possible the form you, you choose is particular is not irrational, uh, not rational, but the way you add it, like the irrational um, gauge freedom become rational. No, so, you, so you, you, you have to make sure that uh, whatever you're writing has the correct SL2C weights. If you do this and you sum over all the solutions to the sketching equations, then the answer is, is, is guaranteed to be rational. I don't think so. Because uh, you keep the, 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 the right weight is okay because you have square inside, so you still have the right at the... No, so, so, sorry, when, when I say the right weight, I mean the right SL2C weight. So yeah, say yeah, you, yeah. you have certain expression in, in the integrands, and you have to make sure that when you do an SL2C transformation, th this, um, this integrand transforms covariantly, such that the integral is, I mean, uh, is independent of this. Yeah, I mean, the, the solutions of the sketching equations will, in general, be very complicated, and you know, square roots will be the nicest things they have, probably, yeah. in, 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 in general. But when you sum over all the solutions, um, the, uh, well, the, you, sh you, you should try to come up with an example. <laughs> I, 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 I challenge you. I can see that you can have the gate freedom, which is the irrational tool. When you add together, it becomes rational. Or the result, eventually, it will be rational. But uh, it's possible. So, so, so there, there is a map between integrands, which have the correct SL2C weights, yeah. and rational expressions. Like the, the, this is along the lines of, of what Emil was, uh, was talking about. 
and, and the, the, there's been other work also on, on this topic recently by Freddy and Humberto. Because it's true that no one wants to solve the sketching equations, right? You, 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 you just want to use the nice properties. I mean, they have some nice properties in, in, in the sense that when you write the amplitude in terms of this, uh, in, in, this integrand, already has a lot of the properties of the complete amplitude, right? Like, uh, say, uh, BCJ relations are, are respected for each solution to the sketching equations, for instance. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, on the other hand, the solutions are extremely complicated, but I, I think the, the way to go is that you don't want to solve them. You want to use their properties, but at the end of the day, there's a map between these <coughs> integrands and rational expansions. And this, 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 this map, which is just now starting to be developed, which needs to be made much more efficient. So, it's equivalent to basically somehow absorbing everything non-local into those uh, uh, mean, and anti -subdual. So, 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 so th th this is quite analogous to the MA3 case, but, but, but it's not exactly... Uh, so, so in the MA3 solution, it is doing precisely the same thing. So, so you, you, you can define the spinner eta such that the spinner... Um, or you can define the spinners of the particles such that they relate to... to to, to this sigma for these solutions. Uh -huh. And then taking, say, the sigma of a certain particle to infinity is exactly the same limit as I described mm -hmm. before. You, you can do it more general too, but um, I mean, the, then the expressions for the numerators will, will, will be longer. I, I, I can show in detail uh, this thing. Okay, so now um, I would like to talk about uh, another example so, 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 well, we, we looked at this kinematic algebra. We saw it come from the self-tool sector. We saw that very close to the self-tool sector in this next to self-tool sector, the structure was essentially still the same. Now we see that if you want to go much wider, uh, we need to define a certain extension uh, of this object. And of course, th things now will depend on the sketching equations. They're not as simple as it was before. But going back to, to our first definition of, um, of, of x, uh, there is still more that we can do with it. Now, um, this, the, um, the status of VCJ at loop level is that there are um, several examples of amplitudes at relatively low number of loops and legs um, which admit a VCJ form. But if you want all multiplicity compact expressions, I, I would say that, that, that the, only, um, the only cases th that have been written down so far will, will be are, are these plus or minus um, and rest plus amplitudes at one loop. Because this is just like uh, one line. This is the complete numerator. What I'll talk about here is a, another such family of almost as simple numerators. And these will be uh, MH3 amplitudes in maximally supersymmetric theories. So N equals 4 super 8 mils and N equals 8 supergravity. Now, this is closely related to, 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 to work uh, with, with these people where, um, where we uh, analyze the constraint imposed by Jacobi identities at loop level and, and devise the methods to, in principle, determine BCJ numerators at any number of points um, for for uh, for one loop amplitudes in n equals four super n mills. However, this is like an implicit definition. Uh, and here I'm, I'm going to give you s some closed form uh, expressions. Uh, there are some hints, uh, perhaps that, uh, that that such a thing would be possible. Uh, the first is that at three level, there's a close connection between MHV and the self dual story. So MHV is the next to self dual. And um, at three level, it doesn't matter if it's supersymmetric or not, as long as, so in the supersymmetric case, if you consider external gluons, it's the same amplitude. Now, at one loop, there's a very interesting formula, uh, which is now almost 20 years old, 
which relates the um, O plus amplitudes at one loop, which are the self-dual ones, to the M H V amplitudes in the supersymmetric theory at one loop. So you can get these ones in D dimensions from these ones in D plus four dimensions. So, um, uh, and this is the epsilon from D plus four minus two epsilon. Um, now, in, in this expression, this, um, this, um, uh, this delta function, it's um, a supersymmetric delta function. If you don't know what it is, you can just think that for external gluons, if R and S are the minus particles in the MHV case, this you have to introduce here to give it the right weights uh, with respect to these minus helicities. Um, but uh, so I, I don't know exactly what is the status of, of this expression at for finite epsilon. But if you take, just take epsilon to zero, then um, yeah, this guy um, is diverging, but there's an epsilon here, and so you're picking up pieces from this divergence, and those pieces will be uh, the O plus amplitudes. I think the origin of this is still mysterious. Okay, so what we will do here is somewhat is, is, is try to go the other way around. Instead of taking starting from MHV supersymmetric and going to the O plus, we'll go the other way around. So for the O plus, we have these BCJ numerators, and now we're going to mutilate these in a number of ways to get the MHV numerators. And this is the expression. So. Uh, so we have this supersymmetric delta function. We have some some factors coming from the the helicities, and then we have a certain uh, sort of rescale numerator which has this expression. So now instead of being just a product of all the x's corresponding to each vertex, it is this beast here. Uh, but what you have is still very similar. You still have a product of x's, but you have a sum over um, you have a sum over pairs of particles. So l let's see wh what we're doing here. First of all, for this axis, we're taking this guy to be one. So we're choosing one of the particles to be special, which I'll take to be particle one. Then the particle one will provide a sort of a boundary for the for the n gon. Then we'll summing, we're summing over all non-neighboring pairs. R, S, no neighboring means they're not adjacent. So going from 2 to N. And for each of them, we, we have the X's between 1 and R will be just as before in the self-dual. Between S and 1, so around the loop, it will be the same. But the ones between R and S will not have powers of L. So uh, what this leads to is that whereas in self-dual gauge theory, the numerator, uh, because there were L, um, um, because there were N vertices, uh, goes like the, the leading power in L is N. Here, the leading power in L is N minus four. And uh, I'll give you some, some examples at, uh, at, at low number of points. So at four points, Let's say we have particle one, which is special. And then um, we write all non-neighboring pairs. Here, there's only one. And then the other vertex is this one. Um, at five points, two, three, four, five. So now we have three terms, because we have this pair to the four, we have this pair, and we have this pair. So the, 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 the x, x for momenta p and k, here is this. Where these, uh, where these are two generally off-shell momenta contractors uh, according to the spinner indices. Um, mass dimension three. No, mass dimension is right, but, but you can check it. Well, you can't. You shouldn't forget that about, about this guy here. So. 
Okay. And then, uh, so at four points, it does not open a loop momentum. At five points, it's linear. At six points, it will be quadratic, etc. Let me make some remarks about this. Uh, first of all, uh, how were these obtained? Um, well, the, the starting point was the work of, um, of Maffer and Schlotter of, um, of superstring amplitudes and then taking their field theory limits, meaning alpha prime goes to zero, and that does obtaining, um, so from open superstring amplitudes, obtaining uh, Supreme Mills amplitudes in 10 dimensions, and then restricting these amplitudes to four dimensions and matching them to some spinner helicity um, uh, formulas, and then looking at those formulas for, for a few hours. Now, um, these are local numerators, so, so the, the, there were these factors here, but they, they just come from the polarizations. So the, um, the numerators are, are, are local. This procedure uh, guarantees that. Uh, and like previous expressions, so such as at five points, the one uh, obtained by Carrasco and Johansson, and, and at six and seven um, by, by our other paper. Um, and, and the nice thing about this is that the I mean, it's not obvious now that this satisfies Jacobi identities because the structure of the axis is now very different. Um, however, that is still true. It, it, but this is, well, it, it is simple to check in some cases. Uh, first of all, I represented the, here the numerator for the n-gon. Um, but you, I could also, you can just as easily get the numerator, say, for when you have uh, external trees. Um, so in, in that case, the numerator is the same for the part of the p-gon, where p is smaller than n, uh, and then for the trees, it's just x per vertex, uh, as it would be in the self-tool theory. So the Jacobis in the trees would work exactly the same, and we only need to be concerned about Jacobis in the, in, 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 in the p-gon, involving the legs which are attached to the pigon and the propagators along the pigon, and and you can analyze this um, and, and yeah it, it, you you can show that the Jacobi identities are still satisfied following the properties of this object X. What's the power counting again? The, the power counting of the is of the individual numerators yeah. is for um, uh, well I guess that the n gon will have the highest power right. which will be L. Yeah, minus, n minus four, yes. So Pentagon has one power. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so in, in these expressions, um, in these other expressions, uh, people were thinking, and they started thinking, okay, I mean, if you have less momentum, that makes it easier. But that came at the price of introducing some non-locality in the numerators. And, 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 and that's, pos that's probably what was then blocking the, the all n um, you know, understanding this to all n because these the grand determinants, etc., will just get worse and, and worse. But these have uh, micro micro these factors of one. No, but, uh, but, but these just come from the polarization uh, vectors. Oh, um, so you don't think it's a micro No, no, you, you, you don't think about it as pure as pole. It's just f from, the, from the polarization. You have to choose some reference vector. Here, the choice is that one is the reference spinner. Um, yeah, we don't know. I mean, we just look at them and I, I, I don't know what they're telling us, but if you have some idea, we'd be happy to hear about it. <laughs> There's no cyclic symmetry on the thing, right? It's broken by your choice. Yeah, it, it's, broken, it's broken by the choice of particle one. I mean, conceivably, the, the, there are some numerators where, where we don't make this choice, but then they will probably be, it's, it's not as, you don't think about it as pure as pole. It's just f from, the, from the polarization. You have to choose some reference vector. Here, the choice is that one is the reference spinner. It, it doesn't look like it, but are you anything like a um, yeah, We don't know. I mean, we just look at them and I, I, I don't know what they're telling us, but if you have some idea, we'd be happy to hear about it. There's no cyclic symmetry on the thing, right? It's broken by your choice. Yeah, it, it's, broken, it's broken by the choice of particle one. I mean, conceivably, the, the, there are some numerators where, where we don't make this choice, 
but then they will probably be much much larger. Even the four-point numerator doesn't have a symmetry. Uh, well, the four-point numerator ends up coinciding with this permutation invariant k k kinematic factor. Okay. But uh, okay. when you when you write, write it like you have to consider this and also then these factors to to see that appearing. Right. So, so so you're breaking that manifest symmetry yeah. to gain another s symmetry uh, at, at higher points. Uh, can you explain uh, that uh, there's a one i square in the numerator? Yes, here. Uh, No, no. So, so um, the, the, the singularity is, is, you know, is only as funny as this one. This reference one. Just just Why is the power oh, two? Oh, I see. Why the power is two? Usually. Sorry. Well, why is the power two? Usually, kind of the position vector has just one power of the reference. Theory. But uh, th this, th these were the rules that I mentioned in the beginning for the self-tool theory to gain another. Symmetry uh, at higher points. Yes, here. No, no. So, so um, the, the, the singularity is, is, you know, is only as funny as this one. This reference one. Why is the power is two? Why the power is two? Sorry? Well, why is the power 2? Usually, kind of the position vector has just one power of the reference theory. But uh, th this, th these were the rules that I mentioned in the beginning for the self tool theory. Um, let's see. Why do I do it? <coughs> Remember, like, so, so normally, this would be the polarization vectors. But if you want to use, see, see things in terms of x, then uh, this guy appears squared. Uh, actually, so, so, so the, the reason why this appears squared is, is to make this object x manifest. Because if you think about this, for each x with this i, there will be one guy of these in the numerator. But, but, but if you cancel them, oh, okay. they, they, yeah, okay. then you're no longer able to see the DCJ structure. Right, okay. You see? So the power 2 is superficial. Uh, yeah, but, but, but um, it's what allows you to see the DCJ structure, essentially. Because this factor, you know, is just doesn't matter what is the order of the particles. It's just an external factor. Um, okay. So, so what is the relation to the dimension shifting formula? Well, in that formula, we get all plus amplitudes from the m three amplitudes. And here, somehow, we get the M3 numerators from the old plus numerators. Wait, so when I say from the, I mean you apply some rule to it in order to obtain it, which is also the same thing as here. What, what is this telling us? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. OK, so this is my uh, conclusion. Uh, I've talked about some perturbative structures connecting gauge theory and gravity, and how they have a simple manifestation in the self dual theories. The self dual theories look like a toy model, but actually they are a lot more than a toy model, it seems. And it's not clear what, how, why this, this, this story is. And open questions, higher loops. Um, it would be nice if, if similar expressions existed at higher loops. We don't know. Um, uh, what is the relation to sketching, to the sketching equations? I mentioned this. And, and also something perhaps a bit more speculative, uh, self-dual gauge theory is well known to be classically integrable. Um, is it so surprising that structures from this theory appear in a theory n equals four superior mills, which is thought to be quantum integrable? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I had to say. Beyond MH3 seem to take us to these catching equations. Um, I mean, in terms of this object X. So I, I, I really don't know. I, I, I would think perhaps it would be more likely to go along the loop than along the K if, if there was an, an extension uh, using still this, just this language. Let me ask a question as well. 
very superficially, it seems to me that every x is a cubic vertex. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of yeah. such x's here mm -hmm. in this formula. What's the explanation for that? That diagram, well, in that diagram, that keyword. So, so in the cases we, we looked at previously, x was, also, was always associated to a cubic vertex uh, explicitly. Uh, but in this case, um, I mean, most of x's are still, are still associated with specific vertices. Uh, but the way that they appear, whether L appears in the vertex or not, um, yeah, that there's some rule for this, but uh, we, well, really, we looked at some spinalistic expressions and then tried to understand them uh, in this language. And, and, and this is, you know, this is what we get. But we think this is probably telling us something, but we, we don't really know what it is. But you still can already Already draw diagrams, right? For each yes. Yes. That's right. Diagrammatic yes. Picture of That's right. What it represents. And, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, and you I can play with diagrams, but we have nothing to say about this at uh, at this point. But yeah, it's true that most axes are still directly associated to some to some um, to, to some vertex there. Um, but say th th this is the only non-local vertex in the graph per term. Because it's connecting, yeah. Uh, you see, it's connecting um, legs which are not uh, which are not adjacent uh, along. Well, which are not yeah next to each other in any, in any way. So, do every term is every term by term satisfy the equivalences, or they, the term has to be? Very no, valid? they they have to all play together. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it depends. Um, so this is a sum over many terms. Uh, if you do a certain Jacobi relation, say, on the second graph there between 3 and 4, exchanging them, it depends whether these guys are close to 3 and 4 or not. But when, so when they are close, you have to play together with the terms. But if you think about a very large uh, graph, then most Jacobis will be, for each term, satisfied individually. 